What I'm gonna say here may come as a shock to you, but as a GP, I don't offer telehealth. I don't do telephones and I don't do video conferences if I can help it. And there are exactly three reasons why I don't offer telehealth as a GP. And this is after almost a year's worth of doing telehealth in 2020, 2021, during that whole COVID thing, if you can remember that one. Now, before we go into those three reasons of why I think face-to-face -face is just so much better than telehealth, I just wanna tell you very quickly about the sponsor of this video, and that is Wellroom. So Wellroom is a YouTube channel focused on design for health and longevity. And this is led by Julia Contaldo, who is a California licensed architect. And Wellroom is discovering the effects of the living environment on the well-being of its occupants. And I'll tell you a bit more about them by the end of this video, and I will leave a link in the description below. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not an absolute hater of telehealth because in certain circumstances, telehealth is absolutely amazing and game-changing. And the two main circumstances where I think that would apply is pretty much remote and rural areas, both for patients and for doctors. Now, this is particularly important in places like Australia. And I'm working in WA and WA is absolutely vast. It's humongous. I think someone suggested that if WA were a country, it would be actually the 10th biggest country in the world. And so most of the population of WA is along the coast and there are loads of areas inland where those patients just won't have access to specialized care. And so telehealth in those situations is a game changer and is absolutely amazing. Now, the second reason why telehealth is great is there are also doctors that are trying to service those areas. And I have spoken about this a little bit in the video, the three reasons why GPs love working in Australia. And one of those reasons is that as a GP, you can put on a lot of hats when you are working remotely or rurally, if that's something that you're interested in, of course. And a great example is being a GP obstetrician, where you will deliver babies hours and hours and hours inland, far away from all the tertiary centers in the big cities. And when I say big cities, I pretty much mean Perth, <laughs> essentially. And so if I was in that position, I was a GP rurally, and there was a woman giving birth who really needed specialist care, the idea that I can have a super highly trained trained obstetrician in Perth communicating to me directly whilst I'm remote and trying to manage this patient is crucial. And it probably is life-saving, to be honest. And so I'm not an absolute hater of telehealth. I'm just gonna explain why I feel that as a GP in a metro area in Perth, where there are hundreds of other practices around me, and this definitely isn't remote or rural, I just don't think it's working out for me. Now, reason number one is the 7% rule. And you probably have heard about this before. The 7% rule is actually the 7, 38, and 55% rule. And that basically splits up the components of communication. And there's this idea that 7% of how we communicate to people are the words that we use. So if you think about that, 93% of what we're actually saying to someone is not the words. And I know that this is a little bit of an old theory and potentially there are people who are now challenging, criticizing it. I still get this sense that it is true because a lot of what we say is actually not the words that we're using, but it's the tone and the body language and that kind of special connection that you get when someone is in the room with you. So when we're talking about that 7, 38, 55% rule, there's this idea that 7% of what we say are the actual words. 38% is the tone and the way that we say those words and 55%, so more than half, is our body language. And as you can see, as I'm trying to explain this concept to you, I am using my hands. I'm kind of tilting my head a little bit. I'm trying to get those extra messages to you so that you can really understand what I'm talking about here. And I feel like out of all of the ways of communicating with patients, telephone is absolutely the worst because you are getting the words. So that's probably 7%. And depending on your personality and your communication style, you may be able to squeeze a little bit more from your tone. But I mean, you've probably noticed this, I'm from Canada. And so the way that a lot of Canadians talk, and this is a sweeping generalization, of course, but I feel that I could do it because I actually am Canadian. We're pretty monotone. Uh, there's not much up and down when we're kind of talking on a day to day. It's just pretty much the same. Hey, how's it going? Hey, and those kind of things. And you're not really going up and down too much. So you're not getting much from that tone. And I feel that both when I was working in the UK and when I'm working in Australia and I'm consulting over the phone, I feel like through the way that I talk in my accent, people aren't really getting <laughs> much of what I'm saying in terms of that tone in terms of that extra information that I want to use to convey a certain message and to come up with a plan that basically works for all of us. Now, you may think that telehealth, so video conferencing someone, is a better way because you can see their face and you can see some of their body language and how they're responding to you. Although, let's be honest, I feel that sometimes video conferencing feels like a Zoom call or a FaceTime call. And we've had a lot of those Zoom calls and FaceTime calls with family members and things. And if you're anything like me and the moment I FaceTime 
I'm someone who's abroad, I am zoning out a little bit. I mean, I don't go to the extent of playing Candy Crush while I'm actually Zooming or FaceTiming someone. But I'm just really not that focused. And I'll probably do things that I wouldn't really do if they were with me face to face. And why I feel this doesn't work is actually reason number two. And that is complaints from patients. Now in 2020, 2021, it was COVID, we were in lockdown and a lot of GP surgeries were limiting the amount of face-to-face -face appointments that they were doing. And so the default was your appointment is gonna be a telephone appointment. Your appointment is gonna be a video appointment. Over that period of time, over that year, we had a 400% increase in complaints from patients. And this was across the board. So it wasn't just me getting all these complaints. Although admittedly, I did get a lot of complaints from patients, which was absolutely heartbreaking. I spent 13 years from qualifying way back when not getting one complaint. So that's 13 years without any complaints. And in that one year, I actually got four complaints. And the reason why this was happening is because a lot of our consultations are complex and they're negotiation. So as clinicians, we want to get to a position where we are offering patients what we feel is the best option, but still giving them a bit of autonomy. Again, that amount of autonomy and decision-making will depend on how serious their condition is. So if we are consulting with a patient and the symptoms they have will probably just get better on their own, to be honest, I will tell them that you do have the option of doing nothing. You could try some basic over-the-counter medication that may speed things up. Overall, I think you're gonna be okay. Now, where there are situations where there are red flag symptoms, they need investigation straight away, we're worried about serious conditions like stroke, heart attack, cancers, we try to be a bit more doctor focused. And by being doctor focused, we are effectively trying to negotiate and convince the patient that we are right and that they need to follow our instructions because it's crucially important for them. And so to be able to negotiate effectively, I feel that I need to be there with them. They need to see my facial expression. They need to see my eyes. They need to see my mouth. They need to see how I'm moving my hands. They need to see how important this is for me, for them to get that care. And we were really missing out on that over the phone. And so effectively without that 55% that I spoke about previously, and you're shaving off a lot of that 38% in the tone because of the way that I talk and my accent and my intonation, you're trying to convince someone to do something that they potentially don't want to do with only roughly 10% of the power that you would have if they were sat next to you and you were having that face-to-face -face consultation. And so what was happening is that I was clashing with people over the phone because I was trying to explain to them how vitally important it is for them to do certain things and they were just not getting it and just wasn't working and these consultations were turning into really long consultations that were turning into arguments effectively and then the complaints just started coming in to the point where I actually created a video and I'll leave a link in the description below of how to deal with complaints because realistically complaints are a great opportunity to learn and to try to iron out any miscommunications that may have happened during that consultation and so reason number two is complaints from patients <laughs> I just feel like I get a disproportionate amount of complaints over the phone uh, over telehealth compared to when we are doing consultations face-to-face. -face. And so reason three, and this is slightly controversial, is complaints from doctors, from me. So I am basically complaining about the people that I'm consulting with. So you may or may not know this, but I have a few special interests. And if you go on our profiles as doctors here in Australia, doctors will list their special interests. And one of my special interests is mental health. I am interested in mental health. I feel there are a lot of people out there who are struggling with mental health and I'm happy to talk about mental health and I'm happy to offer options to help with mental health. And so very often I will get patients who book in a mental health consultation for me. They normally see their regular doctor, but I'm kind of this one off because they couldn't get in with their regular doctor and they just need to sort out something called the mental health treatment plan, which will give them access to counseling. I find that when I have those consultations face to face and it is the first time that they are meeting me, there is a fresh perspective there. It is possible that they have had hundreds of consultations with their regular GP and they don't really go into the nitty gritty of what's going on. It's just kind of superficial. How are you getting along? Things are still the same. Fine. But when you're seeing someone for the first time, it's this amazing opportunity to unpack things, to figure out where is your story coming from? How has it progressed so far? And are you happy with how things are going? Because it is possible that people are just kind of cruising along and they're just like, well, this is probably how it should be. But by seeing someone new, by getting that fresh perspective, we can readjust, we can realize 
online, I can offer certain ideas that perhaps hasn't come to their mind before. A great example, and I have spoken about this in my best practice shortcuts video. So if you are interested in that, feel free to click on the link in the description below. But when I'm doing a mental health consultation, I will always ask about three things. I will ask about past trauma. I will ask about your relationship with food. And I will ask about whether anyone has suggested you have ADHD or autism. And it is often the case that when I see a patient for the first time, these are difficult questions to ask because you are effectively asking that patient perhaps rehash things that maybe they just don't want to talk about too much. When you are doing that face to face and there are ways that you can do that, you slow the consultation down, you have already built up that rapport by asking some general questions, then it is much easier to ask those questions. You're open, you're non-judgmental, you're just asking for information and then providing information in terms of their treatment options. When I'm having telehealth consultations, either over the phone or by video conference, we just don't get to that point where there's that report. I have been in certain consultations where I can see that that person who I'm trying to talk to about their mental health and about really difficult things is just not really focused on what we're talking about. Again, I gave that example about Candy Crush. And I'm absolutely positive that one of the patients that I recently consulted with was playing Candy Crush on their phone whilst we were talking about mental health and doing a mental health treatment plan. Some patients have openly said to me, listen, doc, um, I'm at work, so I'm super, super busy. So if you could just sort that out for me without asking too many questions, that would be brilliant. And again, I felt that was pretty rude <laughs> the way it was expressed to me, but it's possible that I was missing out on that 55%, right? If they were sat in front of me and they said that, to me with the right body language in a kind of open, kind, apologetic way, we would laugh it off and we would just sort things out for them. When that was coming from a person talking from a screen, yeah, it felt a little bit abrasive. It felt a little bit rude. And that's why I feel that face-to-face -face is just so much, so much better. Reason number three, complaints from doctors, complaints from me. When you are coming in to see me about your health, about your mental health, let's just focus on each other. Let's just make this consultation really meaningful and get something out of it. Now, before we finish up here, I just want to thank the sponsor of this video one more time. Well Room, thanks so much for sponsoring this video. Julia travels worldwide, evaluating homes, hotels, and Airbnbs from the health and longevity standpoint. She also does unbox and reviews of the most innovative products that can affect the quality of living space. And please make sure to check out the unboxing longevity chair video because it illustrates how to combine various devices to organize your space. And you can find it by following the link in the description below. Otherwise, I hope what I was talking about makes sense. And if that is working for you and your patients, that's absolutely brilliant. Personally, I feel that we need to readjust a little bit. We need to go back to way more face-to-face -face appointments to rebuild that connection with our community. Right, that's it guys. I hope you found that useful. Otherwise, good luck.